Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for choosing It's Incredible This Works at All. In this session, the reason we are here is to explore some of the low-level technical foundations of how Wi-Fi functions. We're going to dig into some of the steps in the tech that everything from your access point to your laptop to your Amazon Echo to your internet-connected dishwasher are all doing when they're part of a network. We're going to take some time to appreciate the brilliant engineering that has become an indispensable part of our lives by investigating how some of the magic happens. I am Steve Yuroff. I am the senior tech at a two-person IT department inside an 85-person creative agency headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin. There, my comrade and I handle everything that runs on electricity and a few things that don't. Wi-Fi is one of many things that I do, and it's the topic that I've spent the most of my flexible time with over the last year. Enough time that in April of this year, I passed the Certified Wireless Network Administrator exam. CWNA is a vendor neutral exam from the Certified Wireless Network Professionals Organization. It's a starting point exam targeted at those of us who manage wireless networks. So as I studied for this test, I found myself fascinated at some of the beautiful technology that's invisible to us. So I wanted to share with you some of the coolest aspects of low level Wi-Fi with you today. So over the years, I've seen a few presentations that I thought started a little bit too much in the middle of a topic, presuming that an audience comes in knowing too much. I want to try to avoid that by reviewing some Wi-Fi groundwork that I hope puts us all on a similar starting point. There is an international organization called the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and they make the standards for all sorts of electrically engineered stuff, including wireless networking. The original IEEE wireless standard was first ratified in 1997 and was named 802.11. In the evolution of Wi-Fi, 802.11b is really old and .ac is current tense. In between, the biggest milestone was 802.11n and we'll be, wow, and we'll be talking about what was so significant about it. And these letters represent amendments to the 802.11 standard that give us new ways to do, and ways to do new things or better ways to do old things. We see the 802.11 A, B, G, N, and AC most in marketing materials because they were largely about speed increases, and speed increases are great ways to sell products. Other, there are other amendments about how to more efficiently roam between access points on a network, how to make Wi-Fi work for car-to-car -car communications to assist for modern motor vehicles, and many different ideas. We're on .ac because we, there have been amendments all the way through Z, and it wraps around to double letters. Not all the amendments got rolled into standards. Some are abandoned, some are combined, and some are finalized, but no manufacturer actually made use of them sometimes. So the starting point for Wi-Fi channel sizes is 20 megahertz, which gets expanded up to 40 in .n, and all the way up to a crazy 160 megahertz option in 802.11ac. And Wi-Fi exists to provide the lowest two layers of the OSI model. So we're going to take a look at how it provides the replacement for a wire and how we accomplish a really important task on layer two, having all the network particip participants take turns as we move data around in frames. And a crucial Wi-Fi fact is that among the clients and the access point they're connected to, only one can be transmitting at a time yet we can have a classroom all watching YouTube videos. There's just an amazing system to take turns very quickly to give the illusion of continuous connections. So we're going to start at the very lowest levels. With nothing plugged in, how exactly do we use things that we can't see and we can't touch to reliably move data? Well, at the lowest possible level, it comes down to modulating a carrier wave. So what do we mean? All right, it's going to tackle the noun in this sentence first. What's a carrier wave? Carrier wave is a pure, unmodified electromagnetic wave. What's an electromagnetic wave? So when a charged particle is accelerated through space, such as from a radio transmitter, it produces an oscillating magnetic and electronic field. And that's good enough. That's all we really need to know about this. You can go into study wave particle duality if you start going too far into this, but that's kind of far out of scope. We're just going to acknowledge that electromagnetic waves are part of the real world, 
and we figured out how to make them work for us. They go from below shortwave radio up through visible light through gamma rays. The part we're going to concern ourselves with are the small chunks in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz neighborhoods, which are thankfully a long way from the gamma rays because we all know that this is what slow Wi-Fi does to us. So all these waves have characteristics that we can measure and use. The first one is amplitude. How high is the peak? If we were looking at sound waves, this would be volume. And there's wavelength, the distance for a full cycle, anywhere from the scale of kilometers to millimeters. And if we were looking at sound waves, we'd be talking about the pitch here. So in the 2.4 gigahertz band, if we could see the Wi-Fi waves, they would be about this big in the neighborhood of about 4.8 inches peak-to-peak -peak wavelength. In the 5 gigahertz band, they're closer to this if we could stop time and see what they look like. You see, I got two waves here that have the same frequency but differing amplitudes. Now remember that we're looking at a snapshot here. If you could see the waves arriving at a receiver, It'd be like standing at the dock of a lake. You could watch the patterns of lows and highs come on in. And frequency is the count of how many full cycles happen every second. Directly related to wavelength, shorter wavelength, shorter distance between peaks, more peaks in a second, and the measure of, the measure of cycles per second is a hertz. So these waves, they're coming in about one per second, and therefore means one hertz. If you could be standing at the beach watching Wi-Fi waves coming in, we'd be watching a minimum of 2 billion, 400 million of them per second, and the top end of our allowed range, just under 6 billion per second. Okay, so we can make radio waves, and we can measure them on a receiver. How do we make them useful? These waves are analog, but we want them to carry digital data. So we're going to go back to that modulate a carrier wave phrase. Modulate means to change. So how do we need it to change? Well, in this section, we're starting at the very lowest possible levels of a data network, what everything is built on, layer one of the OSI model. At that lowest possible level, it really boils down to creating a bunch of ones and zeros in the right order and getting them received on the far side. So we need a way to represent a one and a zero. Simplest way is declare two states of the measurable characteristic of our carrier wave and declare that one state represents a one, one state represents a zero, and switch between them or not at a declared interval of time, which we call a symbol period. Frequency shift keying is one way that this can be done. As you can see, we have a frequency for zero and we have a frequency for one, and we can see where they are at each of the symbol starts. Frequency shift keying was used in legacy Wi-Fi deployments, but this does not scale up to the speeds that we want to have today. We don't modulate frequency in modern Wi-Fi. So we have to look at other aspects of the wave that we might modulate. Just like in frequency modulation, we can pick two states of amplitude for our carrier wave and have these correspond to a one or a zero. At every symbol period, we evaluate which amplitude we have and record the value. And there's one more fact of a wave that we can measure that we haven't got to yet. Phase is a relative term. You have to compare it to something. In this case, we can measure it relative to our time interval, the start of a symbol. So binary phase shift keying, we can declare our wave starting at zero degrees to be a zero, but if we start it at 180 degrees, that can be the start of a one. We'll note that the, that the uh, waves are not being evaluated at every third cycle, as shown here. We'll get to talking about how long these symbol periods are before we're done. So what if we went beyond starting the wave at 0 and 100, 180 degrees, and we threw in 90 and 270 degrees as start, possible starting points? So now we don't just have a 1 or a 0 in each one of these, fa in each one of these symbol periods, but 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and hey, we just doubled our data rate by getting two bits instead of one. This QPSK is, um, took us up to a data rate of 18 megabits in 802.11a and g, 
18 megabits isn't all that hot. So how do we go faster? Well, we've only played with the phase so far, but we have a different aspect of our wave that we can modulate. Quadrature amplitude modulation is more conveniently known as QAM. QAM is where we start changing both phase and amplitude. Somehow phase gets left out of the naming. I really don't know why. I think amplitude must have had better lobbyists or something. I'm not sure. So our starting point in QAM is called 16 QAM for these 16 combinations of phase and amplitude that we could choose from. So consider each one of these grid targets, grid centers, to be a target amount of phase and amplitude change. And so with each symbol, we can change two variables, 0, 90, 180, 270 degree phase change, and an amplitude change. Up a little, up a lot, down a little, down a lot. So that's kind of cool. How far can we take it? At 64 qualm, we're at plus or minus four levels of phase and amplitude change, and representing six bits of data with each transmission. This is the top end modulation for 802.11n. In 802.11ac, we gained 256 qualm, which takes us to a 16 by 16 grid, eight shifts in each direction for phase and amplitude, and eight bits per symbol. This is the most complicated data encoding within the Wi-Fi spec today. And QAM is not specific to wireless technology. This is used in dial-up modems, cable modems, digital cable, and many other places. Pretty much any internet communications we make has a high chance of being transferred through something that uses these QAM concepts. So this looks like where we want to be. We get eight ones or zeros for every symbol, which is much better than the one we started out with. Why not use this all the time? Well, to answer that, I want to use these concepts to give a shout out to PSU, but of course in binary, since that's what we're working at at layer one. So right up here, I've got a wireless receiver. And we wish to transmit some symbols. And these are going to be symbols. And so we need a transmitter. <laughs> Pam, you're in a sweet spot for this. You must yeah. You're going to want to stand up. Should we make Randy do it? No. Can I shoot him? At the end. <laughs> All right. So, oh, and also, almost forgot, there's going to be some interference on our network. <laughs> What's that? Exactly. It can be like, that could represent the baby monitor. All right, so we want to give a shout out to PSU. So can you spell out a P for me? <laughs> Perfect. There you go. There you go. <laughs> One more. <laughs> no, you're not. I planned it. <laughs> oh! Oh, uh, no, that was there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I got a few questions. Was it particularly hard from there to indicate a zero or a one? No. And do you think I could have um, sent you back a couple of rows and still been able to do that? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If, but you still might have been able to point at that target from a farther point out. 
And you might have even been able to do that with a bigger fan interfering, because I don't think it did much change to it. So, so those are the pros. What's the downside of it? Well, while it's kind of fun to do, that was kind of slow, wasn't it? <laughs> so this uh, binary, the PSK is the simplest but most robust encoding that Wi-Fi uses. So let's take it up to scale. Let's try and do the same thing with the 16 QAM. Do you want somebody else to do it? <laughs> okay, so now at 16 QAM, we get four bits per symbols. And we're only going to have, yeah, you guys stay in the same spot. <laughs> but we're only going to have to use six symbols to transfer our data. Oh, oh I've got to give you the next one. Yeah, it's highlighted. Closer. <laughs> Same one again. Hey! hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we can see that it's getting a little bit harder to hit our targets. So if we got our interference, we might not be able to get away with this, be the, this higher level encoding under some conditions. But we did move out, get our data transmitted four times faster than the previous way. So now... <laughs> <laughs> When we go to 256 QAM, we're going to take this spelling out from six symbols down to three, but at the price of requiring four times as much precision in both amplitude and phase. Give it a shot. <laughs> oh, this might <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Oh, well. No, that's all it takes on this one because it only takes, we're getting um, eight bits per symbol here. So we only have to do it with three transmissions. But we can see that it's going to take a lot more precision and have to be under much more ideal circumstances than something like BPSK or even a lot more flexibility and room for error with the QPSK that we looked at. So thank you. Can we give Pam a round of applause? <laughs> So this is why you only get the great speeds from the marketing materials under ideal conditions. When Wi-Fi has to go through a large distance or through obstacles to get to its receiving side, it's like having, we don't need this here anymore, do we? It's like having more fans around. Um, the signal gets altered by the physical environment. So while the transmitter might be perfect and arrange a perfect 90 degree phase change, by the time it goes through the walls to a receiver, it's 90 degrees-ish. And it's not just walls that affect Wi-Fi. Um, RF energy naturally spreads out and gets weaker. It's called free space path loss. You've seen the concept when you've thrown a rock into a pond and the big ripples track out to smaller ones. There's naturally occurring RF in the universe. Electromagnetic waves don't come just from the radios in our devices. It's part of the background world. You might be hearing the neighbor's Wi-Fi, unless you live in the woods, and then maybe you're hearing the wireless ISP outside instead. Microwave ovens are a classic source of 2.4 gigahertz interference. And us, we are big bags of water that are quite good at absorbing RF energy. So we can visualize the received amplitude and phase changes as a receiver sees them on a constellation diagram. So if every modulation could be received exactly as the way it was sent, each of these 64 or 256 targets would have one single dot straight in the middle with every transmission piled up perfectly. But instead, they kind of tend to end up in a cluster and hopefully toward the center in avoiding being on the edges. So what happens when the receiver sees the signal enough off the intended value, just like one of our, sh you know, one of our uh, nerf shots that say like this, enough off the intended value, where is it? That one, there you are. 
that um, say that one was intended to be in the top target and it came in a little bit low. There we go. Okay, so this means we've induced a change in our data stream. What we said isn't what we heard. So is this going to be a problem? Is this like interacting with one's unique body chemistry where we turn our mild-mannered data into? Up to a point, no. Here Wi-Fi builds on error detection and correction technologies first developed in the 1950s and used in communications from spacecrafts here up through digital video broadcasts. Convolutional coding is a type of forward error correction that adds redundancy and checksums to a data stream so that the receiving side can verify what it got, that it got what was intended, and if the error rate is not too high, use that error correction to reconstruct the intended stream of bits on the fly. So when our data stream to be transmitted goes through the convolutional coding process, we end up with more bits to transmit that when, than went in so we can be more robust and tolerate errors. How many more bits? Well, comes down to the standard answer in wireless. It depends. And by the way, if this is too small for you to see, this is taken from the website mcsindex.com. That's the whole website, really. So under the porous condition, half of the bits in, in the transmission might be there for error detection and correction. And under ideal conditions, five out of six bits could be carrying data. One-sixth is there for error checksums and corrections. So between the modulation and the coding rates, we might be onto a term that you've heard of. It's called the MCS index for the modulation and coding scheme. MCS values start at zero for the simplest modulation, our BPSK and the lowest code rate to facilitate getting communications to work in rough conditions at the sacrifice of speed. So at the top end, well, the naming of the top end of MCS rates varies by what vintage of Wi-Fi we have in use. We're going to take a look at .n and .ac. So in this chart, 802.11n MCS rates are on the left in the yellow, and the highest MCS rate on this chart is 23. In blue, on the right, we have 802.11ac. In .ac, this was simplified a little bit to just to not count every spatial stream as a separate MCS, but we just repeat 0 through 9. Now, if you don't know what I mean by spatial streams, that's okay. We're going to get to that before we're done. So those of you that have a Mac in front of you, if you would hold down the Option key and click on the Wi-Fi in your menu bar, and down toward the end of, there's an indented list in gray. You'll see your current MCS and transmit rates. What sort of things are we seeing around here? Nine, seven, and you got a 15? So you've got an N, you've got an N device, since that's over 10. That would be an N. And Patrick, what did you have? Seven. seven. Eight, nines, three. Interesting. So... Did you, did you wake that in another space and walk in with it open? No? Interesting. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> so these rates are the sweet spot of the most complicated modulation and the necessary coding required to balance speed and reliability of your connection. So how did the device in the AP determined that that was the sweet spot and the best thing they could do. Yeah, actually, um, the criteria for determining the logic that makes these rate selections, which we call dynamic rate switching or adaptive rate selection, they are trade secrets that the vendors, they don't talk about them. There's certainly an assessment of signal strength, error rates, retransmissions, noise floor, and maybe some other measurements. But how each driver makes its choice of rates is a formula that they hold close because they want to say they're more optimal than their competition. I have seen some devices' decision-making process criticized by Wi-Fi folks. In one case, one vendor's gear accused of staying at inappropriately high MCS, which would make the number in your menu bar look good, but a deeper analysis of how well is this performing reveals that despite that convolutional coding, 
many of the frames need to be or were not coming out right and needed to be resent and therefore the whole aggregate real world performance of the network does not live up to the numbers advertised in there it should probably be dropping to a lower rate the important part to know is that it's expected behavior for devices to shift between <coughs> modulation and coding techniques as they are at different distances from the access point and sometimes have to due to environmental changes that we can't observe but they have their logic that they're not sharing. So when we're powering these radio transmitters, how much energy are we putting into them? Well, for perspective, I want to employ Apple's energy saver icon history. As, Apple's, as um, Apple has progressed, the, um, they have used an incandescent bulb, a compact fluorescent, and a uh, LED light bulb for this um, icon. And that probably has outputs of 60, 14 and maybe 8 watts. So in Wi-Fi, the highest FCC allowed output is measured from the transmitter before the antenna is 1 watt. And that could only be used for an outdoor point-to-point -point link, say connection between some buildings. We measure our Wi-Fi transmitter powers in power in milliwatts, which are 1 1,000th one of a watt. 1 to 100 milliwatts are standard output ranges for Wi-Fi transceivers. So who remembers analog TV back before HD? Some of you. So it's a natural occurrence that RF transmissions find multiple routes between the transmitter and the receiver. So besides a direct line of sight, when that's possible, they bounce off of things. Well, when analog TV found multiple paths to a receiver, it might look something like this. A second ghost image appears, shadowing the main image. This happened because the bounce path was a little bit longer than the main path and therefore arrived just a little bit later. Wi-Fi does not get an exemption from this multipath. It is guaranteed to happen in our indoor deployments, which of course is where we use it the most. So in the early standards, multipath was Wi-Fi's enemy and a problem to solve for in deployments. But with 802.11n, the engineers turned this multipath problem into an asset and gave Wi-Fi its single biggest performance leap with the introduction of MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. So before MIMO, every Wi-Fi access point and mobile thing had a single radio receiver transmitter in it, single input, single output. But with MIMO, we started being able to use up to four radios per device at the same time on the same channel to harness this multipath for powers of good. How's it work? Whoops. When a Wi-Fi transmission is received through multiple paths, there are a number of possible outcomes. The least desirable is when one path is so much longer than the other, it can be so far out of sync, their combination can't be used. But there are three other possible results of multipath, all of which we can use to our advantage in different ways. So there's upfade, otherwise known as constructive multipath, where we gain a stronger signal. There's downfade, which is destructive multipath, where the signal is weakened, and it might get weakened all the way down to nothing, which is called nulling. So, uh oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> all right, so here we've got a nice, I'm probably glad I pulled that slide up early. Yep. So, so here we have two different waves coming off of a yeah, that looks good up there. Um, coming off of two different um, radio transmitters in one, the blue and the green. And what we can see is when we turn this, this red is the sum of the two parts. This is our up fade. They are currently, and these two waves have the same frequency, and they have the same amplitude, but they're out of phase. But when we can take two waves that are out of phase, and when they combine all the way from, let's take it this way, at zero degrees, when they're perfectly in phase, we get a new wave that is double the height of either the, of either of the two source ones. And we still get a constructively bigger wave from these two overlapping at a difference all the way out to 120 degrees out of phase, where it's neither gain nor loss, it's the same. This is the end of our up fade. And now, now we're in the region of downfade, where we take them and get them out of sync between 120 and 180 degrees, all the way down to a perfect 180 degrees, and they're completely out of phase. 
If you've ever had noise canceling headphones, this is the same concept that it's working with with sound. It's listening to say it's blue coming in and generating green in the opposite phase and hoping to give you a, you know, a net result of zero at the end. So the first way we can use multipass to our advantage is via transmit beamforming. So my goal in transmit beamforming is to get radio waves from two or more transmitters in a, in a single device to combine constructively at a destination. So let's say I want to arrange constructive multipath where you are sitting right now. How do I know if I'm getting it right? Well, there's two techniques. There's a good way and there's a better way. The good way is called implicit feedback, where I would send something called a sounding frame to you, and you would reply. So at the beginning of every 802.11 frame are transmissions for calibrating the radios between each other called training fields. I'm going to hear the training fields in your reply, and I'm going to analyze them to make an educated guess about how I could most maximize upfade where you are. So it's kind of like sending a sonar ping out hearing what comes back and reacting accordingly. This is the only feedback mechanism available in 802.11n. The better way is with explicit feedback. I send you a frame and you analyze my training fields as you hear them, you do calculations, and you provide feedback, basically saying, eh, based on what I hear, this is what's going to work best to maximize things where I am. So this is a process called channel sounding and .ac only uses explicit feedback. And this explicit feedback is key to providing multi-user MIMO. So in multi-user MIMO, our access points, and it's only for the access points, can transmit up to four clients at the same time in the fortunate situation that a good number of requirements are met, including that it has clients to talk to that understand multi-user MIMO, and they need to be somewhat physically separated in space. I probably couldn't get a multi-user MIMO transmission to you and you simultaneously, but perhaps you and you, things are going to be a lot more likely to work that way. So in multi-user MIMO, an even more complicated channel sounding process is used, soliciting explicit feedback from multiple clients and combining all that stuff together in what's called a steering matrix. And that steering matrix defines transmit parameters at the um, access points antennas that are going to simultaneously strive to make the overlap of waves with your data arrive as maximum upfade for you, but arrive the same waves overlap at your place, arrive as maximum downfade, and then vice versa, and then up to a combination of three of them where we maximize, say, the iPhone in red shows up as, as as much overlap, as much constructive multipath as possible in red, and destructive multipath, destructive down at the other two, in the same way for all three of them. Yeah. <laughs> so what's often better than transmit beamforming is called spatial multiplexing. In spatial multiplexing, we take data to be transmitted, spread it out among the available radios, and transmit unique data streams from multiple radios to a specific client at the same time. So while transmit beamforming might bump us up an MCS rate or two, you'd rather stick with the lower modulation and double or triple the real data transfer rate by taking data to be transmitted, cutting it up, and transmitting sections in parallel over multiple radios. So let's say we've got ABCDEF coming in from the internet. It hits our router. With a single input, single route, single input single output device, we might have to first transmit ABC and then DEF. With MIMO, we can take these two parts, split them out over two radios, and get to transmit them at the same time, and then put them back together on the receiving end. So how can this work? It works because our antennas are separated by at least half a wavelength, and that is the key element to ensure that the paths from the transmitter to the receivers are different. This difference is known as spatial diversity. So think about it. If you've got an iPhone 6S or higher and a number of other devices, you have two full Wi-Fi transmit and receive radio systems in your pocket computer, which will transmit on the same channels simultaneously 
and use the fact that the signal on the left side radio is going to, where's our axis point? There it is. The signal on the left side radio is going to take a slightly different path to it than the one on the right side because they are separated by at least half a wavelength. But the, yet these two radios, they don't interfere with each other. One downside of spatial multiplexing is that individually receiving and recombining these multiple streams into one requires some pretty significant computing overhead from a DSP, a digital signal processor. And the DSPs come with a battery overhead. So that's one reason that many mobile devices still have a single radio in them. There's always a trade-off. There's a middle ground that most devices can sleep an unneeded radio and operate on just one and then turn the other one up when it becomes beneficial to have two of them or more at a time. So a really remarkable visualization of just how quickly Wi-Fi signal strength can change based on location was done by an electrical engineer named Chris Lohr on his YouTube channel. He took a Wi-Fi module, hooked up an LED and a battery, and had his computer change the LED color based on the signal strength um, that the module reported in its place in space. So his first step was just to move it around and observe how small of a change it takes to get an indicated color difference. He's not walking from one side of the room to the other, or even across his whole body, just moving his hand a little bit, and the Wi-Fi signal strengths change. So about any little change in position can alter what radios see. He then took to observing these color changes up to the next level and by attaching what he had in his hand in a mill, having it follow a zigzag pattern, and map it all out in 3D space. So in this model right here, oh, ah. I plugged into Ethernet. I was not expecting that. Now can I get a link? Thank you. So in this model, he had mapped a space 14 inches by 14 inches by 7 inches. I do wish they had some numbers about how much these, you know, exactly what these colors indicate as far as what signal strength changes he was recording, but the denser areas were places where he saw higher signal strength and the more open ones were a weaker space. So when we talk about the spatial streams, we often talk about chains. Chains are a unique combination of a radio and its supporting components. The amplifier, analog digital converters, antenna, all chained together to make a unique transmitter-receiver system, and that transmits and receives independently of others in the device. The standard terminology format for how many chains does a device support is how many transmitters times receivers colon spatial streams that can be sent or received. Where back on the animation, ABC and DEF, those are separate spatial streams. So we might have a device that can use two or three transmitters and receivers at a time. And many top end APs today can support four spatial streams. To my knowledge, there's only one product on the market to put four spatial streams on a user device. Asus makes a PCI card for desktops. It's also possible to have a device with three transmitters and three receivers, but it's only able to, only able to, be, to use two of them at a time. Uh, so if your phone is before the 6S, it's a single stream device. So no matter what the capabilities are of the access point that it can associate with, only one stream can be used between that, between that phone and an access point. And likewise, if you got that ASUS four-stream PCI card, you'd really want to associate that with a four-stream access point. So when our Wi-Fi devices transmit, we said that the smallest channel size is 20 megahertz. How big is 20 megahertz? Well, let's compare it to something we've had around all our lives, AM and FM broadcast radio. So broadcast FM, lives between 88 and 108 megahertz. That's some pretty simple math. So that means, at a minimum, every Wi-Fi transmission is taking up as much frequency space as the entire FM broadcast band. So when we start moving up to 40, 80, and crazy 160 megahertz channels, we're talking two and four, eight, two, four, and eight times that size. Broadcast AM has an allocation, a much lower frequency range than FM. It goes from 530 to 1700 kilohertz. And when we do that math, 
we see that all the AM broadcast stations you can choose from are in a 1.17 megahertz space. So how are we using up to 20, from 20 up to 160 megahertz at a time? Well, so as we discussed the radio waves and how we modify them to transfer data, we talked about it as if the situation was that we were just modifying, doing all the phase and amplitude modulations to one carrier wave, a single transmission. We're not doing it to a single transmission. We're modifying at least 48 of them, or even more, with every transmission. That's a big title. We're going to break it down. So the easy part is the middle two words, frequency division. Our 20 megahertz frequency is divided into 64 channels called subcarriers. Each subcarrier is a unique frequency. It's just like how we have our 20 megahertz of broadcast FM broken up into separate stations, each on their frequency. So, and what we're, what we're really, the way you should look at this is our bottom four objects. Those might be five gigahertz channels, say 36, 40, 44, and then 48 darkened on the side. And then we talk about inside each one of those, we have 64 subchannels inside of each. So multiplexing is the concept of simultaneous transmission of several messages within a single channel of communication, each subcarrier within the band. So maybe a hard of a multiplex theater, one cinema, many screens, one channel, many carriers. Orthogonal. Orthogonal refers to the spacing of each of these subcarriers. So the act of modulating a carrier wave causes harmonics. Harmonics are weak transmissions on other frequencies, but in a very predictable way. So if we take a closer look at just four of our subcarriers and then make them a little bit bigger, make them a bit bigger, we can see where our harmonics are. So orthogonal refers to the spacing. So these are spaced so that the values of the harmonics are zero when other carriers are at their peak. Let's take a look at red. You know, red is one of our subcarriers. At its follow its highest point down, where are blue, green, and purple? They're all crossing at the zero line. So it's this particular spacing of the subcarriers that lets them all be good neighbors to each other and get along without interfering. Any other different spacing, they would start interfering with each other. So what does it mean? It means that when we transmit data in an OFDM system, which is all of them except 802.11b, we're not doing the phase and amplitude modulation to one carrier wave. We're doing that to at least 48 unique carriers, each on their own frequency, and modulate each of those electromagnetic waves. And I say at least because it got bumped up to 64 out of the 52 and 802. 52 of the 64 in the 802.11n. And when we start bonding channels to 40 megahertz and beyond, we start gaining even higher percentages of the subcarriers being modulated and the efficiencies go up. So why not all 64? Some of them are called pilot carriers and they are used as guideline references for baseline phase and amplitude to keep the transmitter and receiver synchronized. And OFDM also uses the outside carriers unused because these harmonics would then be trailing off into the neighboring channels if it didn't put some buffer space. So each of these subcarriers is modulated relatively infrequently, at least as compared to the fact that a full wave cycle happens at least 2.4 billion times per second. But because there's so many of them being used together, that's how we push the data rate up higher. So when we say that channel 36 is at 5180 megahertz, kinda, that's the center. It's really a team of 48 or more of them centered around 5180. So as we discussed, we call every bit or collection of bits modulated on to carrier waves a symbol, symbols. So the amount of time required to transmit a symbol is mathematically defined by that subcarrier spacing. And that math works out that a Wi-Fi symbol lasts 3.2 microseconds. So in other words, each transmission of bits lasts 3.2 millionths of a second. But after 3.2 microseconds, we can't start straight into the next symbol. It, come, it comes back to multipass. So remember that one of our concerns in Wi-Fi is that multiple pass radio waves will take multiple paths between the transmitter and the receiver. Those paths are surely of different lengths, which means they're going to arrive at different times. So if we transmit the next symbol 
too quickly, we run the risk of the following situation. One route of symbol one might get received over the long path. And if we transmit symbol number two too quickly, the short path route for symbol number two might catch up with the back end of, sh of symbol number one. Yes, really, we are concerned with transmissions that take 3.2 millionths of a second potentially overlapping. If they do, it's called inner symbol interference. So to solve for this, there's a pause between the symbols called the guard interval, which is a waiting period. And that's there to assure that the second symbol doesn't catch up and overlap the first one. The standard is 800 billionths of a second, 800 nanoseconds or 0 0.8 microseconds. From there, we can do a little math. 3.2 plus 0 0.8 is 4. That means we can change our symbol every 4 microseconds, which means that there are 250,000 symbol changes per second. So while Pam was rocking those out at one rate, the, the actual Wi-Fi is changing 250,000 times a second. It's indicating another symbol. There is also an optional short guard interval of 400 nanoseconds, which is going to up our symbol rate by about 10% and also run the risk that these symbols might be a little bit more likely to interfere. So we've taken a good look at many of the aspects of how do we, <laughs> of how do we transmit data. So now we're going to turn our attention to when can it stay. <laughs> When can we transmit data? So we're going to move our attention up a level in the OSI model to layer two. We're no longer working with indicating ones and zeros, but working with wireless frames. Transmission from this station to that station or possibly for broadcasted for all stations. So first, why is when can a tra station transmit data even a question? Well, while we can have many bees flying through the air at any given moment, we can only have the transmission from one wireless radio in the air at a particular time. So Wi-Fi needs a way to avoid frames from crashing into each other in transit. So the way Wi-Fi prevents stations from transmitting simultaneously is called carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. Okay, let's break that one down. Carrier sense, it's about asking the question, is the channel being used? Because as we said, we can only have one station transmitting at any given moment. Multiple access. Every station gets an equal chance at being the next one who can go. And collision avoidance. Just like bees running into each other should be avoided, frames running into each other in the air needs to be avoided. That's our goal. This differs slightly from Ethernet, where we use CSMA CD. Collisions can be detected on Ethernet networks, but in Wi-Fi they can't. Why can't we detect collisions? On Wi-Fi, our radios have three modes. They're either sleeping, receiving, or they're transmitting. They're never doing two of these at the same time. So if my radio and your radio were to transmit at the same time, neither of us knows that the other one transmitted because we can't hear it. And the net result is our transmissions are going to make a mess out of each other. And for that little slice of time, no communications were accomplished, which means our network is not serving its purpose. So since Wi-Fi stations can't detect collisions, there is a default presumption for every unicast frame, and unicast is a frame for a single recipient that is transmitted on a CSMA, CA network, it's that something went horribly wrong and it's going to need to be resent. So when a receiving station gets the frame, it calculates a cyclical redundancy check um, on the received frame, which confirms that it was received properly. If it was, an acknowledgment was sent to the original sender, and only then is the transmission determined to be successful. If the CRC fails, there's no acknowledgment, the frame has to be resent. So distributed coordination function is the fundamental access method for 802.11 communications. CSMACA tells us what we have to do, but distributed coordination function gives us the rules how. It contains four items that we're going to look at. First one, interframe space. Just means a pause. That's all it is. They come in different sizes for different purposes, but they help craft what sort of frame is transmitted when, such as making sure the acknowledgement frame comes after a data frame. There is the duration and ID field. 
So at the start of every wireless frame, there's a public announcement of information about that frame designed for everybody to hear. Amongst the information in that, in that announcement, is, um, in that frame, is an announcement of here's how long this is going to keep the channel busy for. That's a key piece of information. Carrier Sense asks, is anybody else using this network right now? And because it's mandatory to get a no on this, we sense for empty airtime in two ways. First way is virtual carrier sense. Virtual carrier sense resets a timer called the NAV, the network allocation vector. So that reset comes from hearing somebody else's duration and ID field. And so and the other stations will hear that and go, okay, I know it's not my turn for that long. I'm gonna hang out until that amount of time passes. And there's also physical carrier sense just listening to hear if any other station is transmitting. And finally, random back off timer. Wi-Fi transmissions are managed by a random number generator. The station who counts down to zero is the one who gets to go. So to give a real world example of how Wi-Fi stations figure out their turn, we first have to declare some starting point on this continually speaking network. Logical place is a beacon frame. So here I have a captured frame opened up in Wireshark, an open source tool for frame and packet analysis. Beacons are the heartbeat of our networks. They are set out by the access points at approximately 10 times per second or 100 milliseconds. And so they are broadcasts for all stations to hear and they tell every station key information about the network, including the network name, what data rates are supported on it, you know, oh, what channel it's on, what data rates are supported, and a whole lot more. And like the other frames, the beacon has this duration ID field in it, which as we said, is a basis for resetting the nav timers on all the other stations. So we're gonna say that we've got two stations, and they both wanna transmit, and they both wanna transmit data. They've received this beacon frame over the air, and because they can read that duration and ID field, they say, okay, I see the airtime will be busy for 2,536 microseconds. I know I got to hold tight for that long. Now, that's just in how long this frame will take. There are shorter frames, there are longer frames. This is the one we're looking at today. So, and by the way, how big is 2,536 microseconds? Yeah, we're making reservations of time on the two and a half thousandths of a second scale. Our Wi-Fi radios are continually starting and stopping transmitting at this sort of time frame scale just to give us the illusion of continuous connections. So when that time declared in the duration ID has gone by, there's a little pause for that inner frame space. And after the inner frame space, we're now in a, little, in a period called the back off time. Each station goes into the random number generation part and they generate a random number from a range, and this range is called the contention window. So on the first attempt to send a frame, the contention window is in the range of zero to 15. It's like rolling a 16-sided dice. We then take that random number, we multiply it by the slot time, which is just a set number of microseconds. How many depends on the network type. So the result of this multiplication is a number that means when this amount of time has gone by, and you haven't heard any other stations transmit, now it's your turn. Let's see if we can take a look at how this plays out in the real world. I've got an access point, and it creates, and it transmits a beacon. And among the data in it is that duration and ID field. Our two laptops hear this. So due to reading the value in that duration field, both see that they're gonna have to yield to the access point for our 2,536 microseconds. They pause for that amount of time, plus the inner frame space. Then they go generate a random number in the range of zero to 15, because that's our starting contention window. And that sets the basis for how long they have to pause before they try to transmit. So let's say here that left comes up with seven and right comes up with 10. They multiply that by the slot time and they wait that amount of time. That amount of time goes by and we're gonna say that we don't hear any other stations transmit. So that means left has now counted down to zero. If it's still true that there's no other stations have been heard, uh, that means it's now it's left's turn and left gets 
and left starts transmitting. So during all of this, let's remember that all stations that are seeking a turn, they're listening to the channel. So when right is counted down seven slots, left starts transmitting, it hears it, and it instantly pauses that countdown timer at, and holds it at the three that it counted down to. And so it pauses for that duration period while left does its transmission in its tiny little fraction of a second. And so, um, so once that nav timer counts down to zero, so yeah, so once the nav timer gets down to zero, and we wait for that interframe space, then right can go on counting down again from three. So now he counts down to one slot, and if it's still clear when his countdown timer hits zero, now it's right's turn to transmit. Now let's say that this time around, right doesn't get back an acknowledgement that the frame it sent was properly received. We're gonna remember this is our default expectation. We presume failure, so we're ready for this. Right goes back to listening to the channel. Um, and at the next back off time, picks a new random back off value. Picks a new back off value, but this time it's round, that number is gonna be in a doubled contention window. Instead of zero to 15, it has to pick something between zero and 31. With each successive retry, we double the range of potential values. Same rules get applied. Count down the time slots while listening for the channel to be used. If another station starts transmitting before you hit zero, pause the timer for that announced duration. Then, after the interframe space, resume your counting down until you finally hit zero, and then it's your turn. If you get an acknowledgement back, everything's good, we can go on to the next frame. If not, you gotta pick a new random backup value from a range twice as big as the last one. So here we have a system designed to get stations a transmit opportunity as soon as possible while trying to minimize the probability of two stations transmitting simultaneously because plan A is to get the transmissions right the first time. But collisions are expected. It's completely normal that two stations on the same channel pick the ran same random back off value and collide requiring a retransmission. One of the things that impresses me the most about distributed coordination function is the size of the time slots that we're talking about. This random number generation, countdown, listening, transmitting, receiving acknowledgement is going down thousands of times a second in this network right here, right now to coordinate airtime among all the devices here. This is why we can have a room full of iPads watching YouTube and even though only one little bit of data can be transmitted at once, we can share it between everybody. Stations don't need to know if other stations have joined or left the network or how many others there are. CSMA, CA scales very robustly. Sometimes I wish we could see a light that accurately depicted the length of every transmission, but I think that only this guy could actually perceive it. So in this section of a Wireshark capture that we're zoomed to here, we're looking at 20 frames where the total air time spent transmitting them is well under two one hundredths of a second. And this isn't even a particularly heavily loaded network. Well, there's a lot of information in this capture. Here we see many data frames and acknowledgements. And there's one particularly clever frame exchange I wanted to take a look at in more depth. It's called the request to send, clear to send conversation. So, so far in our investigation of distributed coordination function, I said that devices on a network hear each other transmit a duration field, which tells the others they have to be quiet for that long. And that works great if all the devices can hear each other. What happens when you've got a device way at the east end of a coverage zone, and you've got a device way at the west end of a coverage zone, and they can talk to the access point adequately, but they can't talk to each other? That means they're going to be ignorant of each other's broadcasts, and we've greatly increased the probability of them trying to transmit simultaneously. So the solution to that is to centralize the job of resetting every station's nav timers through the access point. So RTS-CTS works like this. Station gets a turn to transmit, according to the rules that we just discussed, but it doesn't send the data. It sends a request to send frame. So this request to, this request to send tells the access point how long the station is going to need to transmit its data. The access point then replies 
with a clear to send that every station can hear using the data provided by the requester. So now everybody on the network knows how long they need to stand down for. Basically, hey, I want to do this thing and it's going to take this long. Okay, you do this thing and it's going to take this long. And now everybody hears this transmission and they all know they need to be quiet for a while. This addresses a classic Wi-Fi problem called hidden node where a station, whoops, where a station uh, too far away from others leads to many collisions and therefore retried transmissions. Doing this does have an impact on network speed because while the RTS, CTS are short, they do take some time and they add up to affect network performance, probably less, create less overhead than having to resend frames because of collisions. Okay, I know that was a lot of stuff. So let's take a minute to review where we've been. In carrier sense, multiple access with collision avoidance, we covered that every single time a station needs to gain airtime to transmit a frame, it goes through a period of listening, pausing, and random number generation to determine when it can transmit. When that turn arrives, its data is passed down to a convolutional coder that adds error detec detection and correction bits to the stream at a data rate deemed appropriate for the network conditions. And that data stream is likely separated out to two or three spatial streams in order to increase our data rate. Each of those spatial streams is comprised of modulating at least 48 separate carrier waves per 20 megahertz, so the data is spread out amongst those subcarriers. And a constellation point for that modulation rate is assigned to each, and that much phase and amplitude modulation is applied to that wave. Guard intervals are used to ensure that symbols don't overlap in the 3.2 microsecond transmission time per symbol. And multiple radios might also be used to transmit the same data at ever so different timing so that one, de one destination receives them as upfade, but it arrives as downfade in another, using an output power measured in thousandths of a watt. On the receiving side, these phase and amplitude changes are received and interpreted as the groups of ones and zeros they represent. When multiple streams are used, digital signal processors help clean up multiple received signals and focus in on the best ones. Forward error correction processes received data, and ideally, the original data stream is reconstructed on the receiving side. If the data passes the cyclical redundancy check, an acknowledgement frame is sent back using all the same layer one technologies. If the redundancy check doesn't pass, no acknowledgement gets sent back and the frame has to be transmitted again. And besides all the above, there's a number of steps in every transmission that didn't fit into this presentation. And everything I just reviewed might go down in under a thousandth of a second. I hope you can see why I titled this, I find it incredible that this works at all. So if you thought this was fun and would like to learn more, I suggest the CWNA program. I say it's equivalent to a serious college level course. Everything you need to know is in this book and you can study it all on your own. It'll teach you a very wide variety of Wi-Fi aspects, including network design, security, how you do site surveys, differences in antenna types, what goes in in each amendment, how devices save battery power, which is really super cool and I wish I could have got that in here too, and a lot more. Matthew Gast has written two much smaller texts that I found very useful for learning Wi-Fi, the 802.11n and AC survival guides. I'm a big podcast consumer, so if you're also into them, I recommend putting cleartosend.net in your feed. And for blogs, there are, of course, many, but a great starting point is Andrew Von Nagy, revolutionwifi.net. Andrew has many great posts, and my OFDM illustrations came courtesy of him. And lastly, the Certified Wireless Network Professional Program is the overarching program that handles industry certification for the Wi-Fi world. They sponsor some conferences, they have an online forum, and I make sure to hit up their Wi-Fi question of the day as my daily Wi-Fi test to make sure I don't forget things. And although you did not send an RTS, you are clear to send questions. Okay, let's see how well I can throw. 
had a question about the beam forming. Okay. Um, so that will only work with a 6S because it needs two antennas to work, right? Um, for in or, or if, we're, if we're talking in the scope of iPhones, yes, I'm pretty sure that the 6S is when we got um, um, MIMO on the phones. Okay. So, well, the trans well the beam forming. I, I can take that back. The beam forming can be used with any single stream device because you're taking you got a radio with two transmitters in it. Right, and we're trying to do that um, constructive multipath from the you know the transmitter on the left and the transmitter on the right to get a little bit stronger signal for that you know the overlap anywhere from 120 degrees out of phase to zero made the red that made the stronger one. So you can do that with you know you can do that with an iPhone before the 6s. But to get the two spatial streams where the visualization was ABC and DEF simultaneously, yeah, the first iPhone that had that was the 6s. Thank you. Yep. So for all of the different features and attributes and just everything that you just went through, how much of that, I mean, at what points through 802.11b, 802.11g, A N, AC, when did these things come in? Because for example, this year the Wi-Fi at the conferences held up reasonably well. Sure have, yeah. Is it because we're on later hardware that tolerates these features better? Or Gosh, it's a tough question to know why it got um, why it got better. You know, the standards of OFDM. It's actually kind of a little interesting that. Um, so you probably know that 802.11b, you know, hit the consumer marketplace. You know, as were products that we had, but 802.11a, you know, that's obviously an earlier standard. Um, a did not get um, market traction in, you know, to be sold because uh, my understanding is that the, you know, the technology to build the chips reliably back at that time were not at a competitive price point. So it's not moving to that. It's probably, you know, I'm, you know, we're largely not getting benefits out of multi-user MIMO here, I'm sure, because um, Apple's devices aren't currently. So. Probably our best benefits are, you know, we've moved up to AC network, and I don't know if the throttle is on the back end, too, because you can now, administratively, you can always say that per station you have, you know, one, you know, a limit on rate or such, you know, per, so I don't know. Chris, looks like you've got ideas. Chris? Mm, no. Yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, obviously, I've been paying attention to what the conference has been using in the rooms for the last few years. The number of access points and their positioning has also improved. Yeah, I don't remember the history, and clearly we've got a good, a nice Aruba there and right there, and the whole place is... The, the first year, there were access points under the podiums. Oh, so yeah. So the, posi the positioning was very Yeah, different. so the re kind of the reason that I'm cringing when Chris says there were access points under the podiums is... Uh, it's an imperfect analogy, but you can get pretty far with considering um, your access point as a light bulb. And so if you wanted to shine light on an area, sticking it under the podium isn't the most effective way to do it. Certainly it goes through wood, but right at ground zero, you're now, you know, that interference that we looked at with the fan, well, you're starting it right there. You're guaranteed to have it. Nobody has a straight shot. So, um, yeah, they've done, I guess they've done a much better job of placing gear at here. Yeah, I think uh, this hardware refresh either went in two years ago or three years ago. Yeah, yeah, we can tell that they've re-engineered. I mean, there are some of us who've come for a while and remembered it just collapsing midday, and nope, it's Thursday afternoon. I haven't seen it collapse yet. So, at the, the same time, the. What? 204 fell apart. Yeah. Was there, another question? Was there another question that I need to? All right, then. Thank you.